Let's turn now to, of course, uh, the future of TV with the rise of smartphone and tablet use, the popularity of YouTube and the growth of IPTV. There's been plenty written about the impending end of traditional broadcast TV. But the Future of TV report from Magna Global shows the time spent viewing TV isn't falling. To tell us more about the latest research, we're joined by Victor Coronis, the Managing Director of Magna Global. Here in the studio, Victor, thank you so much for coming on the thank show. You. Well, firstly, uh, looking at the, the research that you've got, it, it seems to show that the TV broadcast model is, is far from broken. No, ab absolutely. I think it is a very robust industry at this point in time. TV is still considered perhaps one of the most powerful mediums um, in terms of for an advertiser to, to get their message out there. But it definitely is going through transition. It's evolving. And I think like anything, any media um, has to go through an evolution to constantly meet the, the changing needs of consumers. Victor, one of the interesting things I thought that threw up that the um, you talk a lot about the four screens, um, people get involved on on different devices. It's led to a, uh, a lessening of the number of big traditional TVs in the home. But does this have an impact on, on advertising? Well, the, the way we look at it is uh, it's creating um, extra opportunities because all of a sudden now we've gone from an environment where we used to think of TV just in its linear programming format. Um, but now having different screens that enable us to reach consumers at different places and times on different devices, all of a sudden that actually opens up uh, new opportunities for advertisers to create very specific messages to a consumer. Is there a screen that you think advertisers have had trouble uh, adapting to? Or would you say mobile? Would yeah, look, I think definitely mobile is... It's, it's certainly been the area that everyone's been expecting big things for a number of years. Um, and, and I think everyone, not just advertisers, but the entire industry is grappling with it. And probably one of the key barriers is really the size of it. How do you change your communication message in a, in a much smaller screen than what we've traditionally used, say, in a large TV format? Mm -hmm. So definitely mobile has some challenges at the moment. And you mentioned talk, changing their communication message for different screens. Is that ultimately going to cost the advertiser more to reach maybe the, the same people or a, a little bit? Look, I think, yeah, I think there is potential maybe in the short term, but I, I would think over time as advertisers develop learnings, they will um, evolve their messaging, they'll become more targeted, therefore that means less wastage, which hopefully then translates into improved ROI in terms of what they do. But it's a test and learn environment as they start to move in that space. I just wanted to ask you about ad skipping because obviously with better technology you know, it leads to a rise in, in more ways to, to skip ads and, and catch up TV viewing as well makes that easier. Is there ways for advertisers to combat this at all? Uh, yeah, I think they're already doing that. If you, I mean, you can see a number of advertisers who are increasing their efforts in sponsorships, integration, branded content, even simple things just developing their commercials so that in a fast-forward environment, those messages still keep coming through. So um, if you imagine an ad that's in fast-forward mode, but the branding and our key message is sitting static in the background, advertisers are finding ways to keep that message cutting through at all times. What are, you know, working with broadcasters, what are they, do they sort of acknowledge ad skipping? So there used to be a bit of a denial that it was sort of happening. Is it sort of acknowledged now and has it been reflected at all in ad rates or is that a crazy Yeah, look, I, I think everyone's grown up to the, the reality that um, it's, it's occurring. But uh, I, I guess I should premise it by saying that the ratings that most of the negotiations take place with, uh, um, any fast forwarding that takes place actually doesn't get captured in the ratings. So we're only paying for non-fast forward rate ratings, mm. I guess, if that's a way to sort of describe it. So yeah, we're, we're, we're not having to pay for the fast forwarding. Yeah. yeah. Something that you talk about is, is the fact that exclusive content is uh, the big TV network play. Are we seeing that in the, the primary channels uh, on, on free-to-air, the way they're being programmed now? Yeah, I think um, the free-to-air networks are starting to realise it's important for them to control content from start to finish. So developing local content is really becoming, I guess, a key pillar of their, their programming strategy. And we're seeing that more and more. So be it an international franchise, but having it localised, gives them control of unique local content that they can control from the time it goes to air in the first broadcast to then any of the platforms. And I think, you know, we that will be an ongoing trend, I would see. So I guess you're referring to their shows like The Voice, which massive audiences. My Kitchen Rule's another one, like yes. the big, big central 
uh, programs. Yeah. But what's that mean for media buys for all the other shows that surround it, which are getting the 200, 300,000 yeah. and also all the digital channels? Have you got to work a bit harder to sort of... Look, I, I think it's um, market forces will always dictate, I guess, the price of media. But we would certainly see that the bigger rating shows are going to be attracting bigger audiences and therefore have potential to attract a higher premium. And the lower shows we would expect that probably have lower rates, lower cost per thousands in terms of that. So hopefully the combination of the two results in a, in a, in a balance. But you know, we're, in a, we're in a dynamic market so no one really quite, quite knows what's going to happen but that's certainly the, 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 the way forward at this stage. Can you just explain for me this idea of lean forward and, and lean back in terms of, of viewing and engagement and, and you know, whether the, the consumer is more receptive in, in either engagement mode? <laughs> yeah, look, you know, I, I think what we've recognised is that they can be receptive in either mode and what's, what's important is understanding the state of mind they're in. So the, the lean back is, if you're imagining you're in, in the lounge, is that you're sitting back watching TV, you're enjoying it, you're relaxing and you're allowing... Um, advertising to wash over you, perhaps, um, you know, without being too worried about it. Whereas a lean forward is a much more engaged sort of state of mind. You are specifically doing something, um, most likely in a, on a small screen, be it a smartphone or a tablet or a PC, and you're specifically doing something. So your attention is much more focused and probably less tolerant to having numbers of ads washing over you. You want to get to the content or whatever it is that you're doing much faster. So the interruption model is slightly different. But if you add value through that experience in the lean forward to what they're specifically doing, then there's huge value for advertisers to find that space and play in that space. What about research into people's multitasking? You know, if I'm on Twitter or social media, yeah. I'm probably doing that in an ad break. I might be missing some of the communications. I yeah. guess that puts pressure on the creative to really capture that person. Yeah, look, you know, and it's, uh, let's be honest, it's, um, we may be in, a, in this new world of multi-screens, but it's always been there. Um, that, that dynamic of, you know, being in the lounge room, um, having a tea break, going to the toilet, there are always distractions going on with consumers. It's just so, different things happening in the same. A absolutely. So the, the challenge is that um, using or harnessing these screens to help bring greater focus or attention to what it is that we're doing. And if we do that right and add value to the consumer through that experience, everything should um, see a better result in terms of what advertisers are getting out of their advertising dollar. Look, I'm probably not the best person to ask this question because I'm a, a very slow convert <laughs> to Twitter. But looking at social media, I mean, is it, in your view, a, a challenge or an opportunity? Perhaps? Oh, look, it's definitely both. There, there's no denying it, but there's, there's huge upside. If you think about it, we know that you know, virtually everyone, 90% of people, talk about their favourite TV shows on an ongoing basis. And our research shows that 19% um, of those actively talk about their favourite shows in a social space. Um, so that's showing uh, an incredible level of engagement um, and that in itself uh, creates opportunities if we understand um, what people are talking about, how endeared they are to a particular show. Because then it means if we can understand that engagement, and I, an example would be something like The Bold and Beautiful. We currently do tracking on, on social um, ratings and we find that Bold and Beautiful in traditional ratings is quite low but in the social setting you've got a very highly engaged audience. Um, it's, cl it's close to um, I think in the number one or number two show from week to week um, in terms of how people view it and that, that in itself suggests a different level of opportunity and, and engagement that advertisers should be thinking about not, not just purely about ratings. What about things on the horizon that might change viewing patterns or the way we you know, advertise and interact with the audience? Smart TVs, you mentioned that there's been some growth there, but is that still quite a small factor and, and apps and stuff might arrive, but it's not going to do yeah. much short term? I, I think it's definitely an emerging platform, but uh, I think already we're seeing signs of um, players like Foxtel who um, have been able to bring the world of IPTV to consumers without actually having to rely on um, a smart TV. So using a set-top box, already then you're, you're talking about significant penetration of households, you know, over a third of households that have this potential to move into this space. Um, so the, the actual smart TV is probably something that will continue and we'll see opportunities further on. 
um, but it's probably not right there at the moment. It's not at that critical mass. And just on that, I mean, with the, the launch of Foxtel Go, it's been such a, a huge success on, on, on the tablet. I mean, do you see that perhaps as being uh, a more accelerated route over, say, a smart TV? I, I think definitely the, the whole notion of increased mobility around distributing content is really compelling for consumers, knowing that they can get content anytime, anywhere really works for them um, and, and and that is the future so it's 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 less about the technology the technology is the enabler but it's it is about how do we get content into consumers hands or how are they getting it um, and then what is the advertising opportunity that we can then overlay in that whole uh, environment um, and just uh, finally I mean looking at, at kind of exclusive content providers like Netflix and, and those audience participation apps uh, do you think there's going to be some time before we see sort of um, any significant impacts from from IPTV at all um, I, I think there are, there are opportunities and really it comes back to the quality of the content and if we can if a con if a consumer can find that content that they really love and a provider like Netflix can make that happen, then they, they will look to that sort of service. Uh, we, you know, in, in Australia, we're probably renowned for seeking out content illegally um, if we really love it. If we can't find it anywhere in our, in our free-to-air space or, or any, on any we're of the TV channels. We're doing the wait for it. <laughs> that's right. So that, that's, that becomes the opportunity for players coming into the market to actually get content to a consumer faster um, any way they can. It's been great to, to hear all about the, the research. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Yes. Victor Crone is there from Magna Global. All right, do stay with us. Coming up on Media Week, we'll get all the latest on the TV ratings with James Manning.